Hello everybody and welcome. Thank you very much for being here. I am so excited to be here in this extraordinary 12th century church here in the heart of medieval Dublin for the launch of the Storms issue 3. It feels like the perfect setting because this issue had a theme of shelter, sanctuary and sanctum and what better a place to be. So now I'm going to begin by saying a huge thank you to Canon Mark Gardner, who allowed us to come here today. It's normally his church. He has a service here in the Church of Ireland every Sunday at 10 o'clock. And also a huge thank you to the guides from the OPW, the Office of Public Works. This is the third issue of the storms. And the reason the storm started was because of the popularity of the poetry podcast, Eat the Storms. So I've just finished Season seven, we've had over 625 national and international poets take part. It's now on over 12 platforms. And the poetry podcast began because back in July 2020, my debut collection was, this was going to be published, it was called Eat the Storms. It was in the middle of COVID and nobody was going to hear anything about it. So on one sleepless night in the middle of a panic attack, I decided to start the poetry podcast, Eat the Storms. Now here we are. It's three years later, seven episodes, seven seasons of the podcast, and now issue three of the journal, and this amazing community that has built up because of it. And I'd like to say thank you to each one of you for taking part in it, and I hope you continue to take part in it. It is really so um, invigorating for me. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what you can expect to find inside of issue three. We open with an alien in a living room, sipping lattes in designer tracksuits, and we move to invitations to travel beneath the skin, to place marigolds on vases on windows, to name the comfort of things like home, hope, hold, to learn how to hold each other, how to hold ourselves when the others move on, how to be nests of tomorrow, to be winter and to weave silver threads from stars, to recall sunsets, safe spaces, six black capped chickadee bird eggs, grass snakes that need mothers, and mooing cows there to comfort soon to be broken daughters. We catch glimpses of boys busy on the inside, in the in-between, in boathouses and vents of extractor fans, on bridges departing, watching tides, waiting for the final boat call, the great migration of our day feet tumbling into the footprints of a past we are doomed to forget, a past that distracts us from living, that buries us in layers of December until we break out of the wet autumn dirt into Monday morning mists, into shades of back gardens, smoking Virginia slims and snipping, Cradling it all in the memory of a snow globe, a house of mirrors, a menu of mother's favourites. These are the journeys into a place of stillness, quite profound, gentle, delicate, beyond ambition, competition. These are tales that are weightless, vulnerable, freeing, where winds whistle and the dark can comfort. And strangely enough, for a literary journal, we end in a place of healing beyond a language that turned words to weapons. And speaking of endings, I'm going to read you the last poem that appears in this anthology. It's by P.D. Lyons, and P.D. could not be with us today, but I'm going to read it today because of the times that we're living in, because when we look out and we look at the Ukraine, at Israel, at Palestine, this poem appears to have so much resonance. 
So thank you once again. Thank you all of you for being here today. Thank you for coming to seek shelter in this church sanctuary for a few hours in the sanctum of art and literature. PD's poem is called The Long Term Healing of Our Lives. The people who had cured themselves from a virus they once called language communicated eloquently with their hands, their arms, their eyes, the colour of their skin. Impossible to be misunderstood, they learned of the wind's worship of leaves, how the sun with every shadow enjoyed each day by day, and the height of midnight stars all sparkling, happy with the moon, longing for its return. Eventually they forgot the coarseness of verbal abuse, trickery of its seduction, con of its half-truths. Made themselves dwellers on an island, rescuers, healers for those washed up from the deep, Unafraid of reinfection, they let the long-term healing of their lives speak for them. Thank you very much. Now, first up today, I am so delighted to welcome the sub-editor for this issue, the joy of being the editor-in-chief of the Storms is that for each issue I get to work with a different sub-editor. I see Eileen here. Gaynor couldn't make it, but thank you very much for being with us. Um, not only does it mean that each issue has a variety in terms of the selection process, but it also means that I get to work and get to know one individually really closely. And my goodness, it has been such a pure joy to get to know this exceptional poet who is brave, ballsy, driven and so determined. She has such a passion for words. There were times where I was reading pieces and thinking, I don't know what this means. And she would read it and I would go, I still don't know what it means, but yes, this is it. Her debut collection, Pan Wine, Tapper and the Boy at Jericho, was published by Dira Press in 2020, and it was nominated for the Piggott Poetry Prize, and it also featured as one of the top poetry books in the Irish Times. Her work has appeared in various journals and publications, and she's currently a facilitator registered with the Irish Writers' Centre. When I was reading one of her poems for this issue, Peeling, I was reminded of a photograph I took six, five, six years ago when I was in the palace in Seoul in South Korea, and I thought this is going to be the perfect accompaniment to Nitty's exceptional work, and so that's why it became the cover for the journal. I am so proud and so overjoyed to hand you over to the exceptional Nitty Kassler. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, I know my voice is kind of um, really low. And uh, no, it, it has been a pleasure. So it, it's my first job as a, an editor, really, and it was interesting to be on the other side. And uh, what I found interesting as well is that I did the editing blind. So I didn't really know the people who wrote the poem. So if you find yourself here, it's because, you know, your work is exceptional and, you know, it's deserved to be in here. And, um, and I think it's kind of helped me as well to know that it's, it's, it's not, nothing personal sometimes when you get rejections as a, as a poet. It's, it's really isn't anything personal. 
and uh, that had um, it has encouraged me to to keep going. So I, I've, I've you know I've taken a lot from from this journey from this experience. And you know, like I was I was telling Damien, I think the most important thing that I took from this is getting to know you as as a person, as a as a human, and as a friend. It's it's just been a joy. And uh, thank you all so much for sending your poems. They were we had a great time. We really loved it. Thank you so much. I'm going to read my poem called A Reef of Her Own. It's on, pen, it's on page 105, um, so if you want to read along with me. Uh, it's one of the poems uh, that I've written for the, the decade of the centenary because I, um, I was a part of the, the Porteous commemoration by UCG. So that, um, I got that submission, what do you call, uh, I got it when after, after I published my debut collection this would have been the first job, the first project I had to start writing. And I found that there were just a lot of poems that kept coming. And when Damien approached me for a poem, and this one just, it's kinda, it fits in the book. And I would um, encourage you to look at the, uh, um, the events for uh, the decades of the centenary, because this is the last year, so it's run for 10 years, and this is the last year to honor the, the 1916 rising, so it's especially at the end of the year, was, there was a lot happening in the country to, to close off the, the, the decades of the centenary. But something I feel like it, it, it's we all people of you know with these events, it, it did so much for us, and um, it needs to be recognized and celebrated and remembered. So if you can find an event near you to honor those that have done so much for us, I, I would encourage you to do so. So, a reef of her own. By God's design, its seed will grow another. The bay leaf, the common, the butcher's broom, the florist cuts each year. Her very hands are caught in audience from that which have worn the threads on spittles and handled a ruffle somewhere down the line. Now the twizzle spins are its fall to face. It tackles it. First, a base friend to a circle. This notion that one life is a run of another and the other to never meet an end. A molding like a sireland in the ocean where a boat can dock at any point. Leaves unlined like comrades in a tear, their epigenic memories imparted from the soil that keeps it, feet bare to feel the waves of songs the soldiers long gone drowned. I lament the wetland will not forget, and we remember Stonebreaker's yard and danced the bogle call with bowed heads when done with wiring the leafing, hiding the walkings, the laurel, the citadel holds it a shrine at the forefront of the break of light to day's dawn, till the blades give in to the fasting, attesting a courage unjust even then to have to be called upon, as it rots and crisps to a dust that mustn't be pitied. This reef no man's head can fit. A solace at city's reveille, lacking wayward, bare and sterile, not a numbers, but it is a reef of her own. Thank you. Our next guest is born here in Dublin, is a fluent Irish speaker and writes in Irish and in English and currently lives in Galway. And I was fortunate enough to be introduced to her work recently when she was a guest on the poetry podcast Eat the Storms. She was shortlisted this year for the Evan Boland Emerging Poet Award. Her work has appeared in places like Howl, The Four-Faced Liar, Drawn to the Light Press, The Galway Review, The Echo and Poetry Ireland Review. And she was also one of the Poetry Ireland Introduction Poets in 2022. Please enjoy the poetry of Katrina Ling. 
Sometimes you wonder where poetry comes from. So one day I was driving in Wicklow and uh, I just saw in big graffiti on a wall the words, let the hair sit. And I thought, what's that? Because I had been writing about hairs. I live in Connemara and they're very mythical and magical. And I thought, what's that about? So I looked it up and um, I suppose it's, it's something we could all take on board when we're feeling stressed, you know, just kind of chill out, let the hair sit. But it's also give the hair her corner and um, the pesticides are doing great damage to the hair because not a lot of people know that the, the, the rabbit burrows but the hair nests above ground. So this is on page nine, eight. Let the hair sit. Do not mow the meadow's edge. This is the hare's corner. She settles her form into the long grass to birth. Let the hare sit long enough to nurse. When she runs her errands at dusk, the ragged robin and dandelions will dance with the bell heather and buttercups, a curtain of colour shielding her leverets from prying eyes. So. We are now heading to County Carlow for a short story writer who lives in the Black Stairs Mountains, and there she is working on a collection of short stories. She has a master's in Anglo-Irish literature and drama, and has had work appearing in places like Splunk and Sunspot Literary Journal. Today, reading for us her short story from the storms called Do You Remember Skies? It is a joy to hand you over to Roisin McIntosh. Do you remember skies? Once, I penned the phrase, the sky lay turneresque as it blessed the evening. A mind could conjure that image, I'd thought, the pinky pale peach wishwash of sunsetty gold salmon swirling into a dream of a sky, a hope of a heaven translated to canvas. I see the same sky projected back to me as I buckle into the car, setting out again throwing the old Chevy around the cliff road once more to visit you. In 1997, we'd driven the going to the sun road in Glacier Park, Montana, sunned brown and in love. Declining at speed, you made a look no hands move, steering with your elbows to terrify me or make me laugh. Both meant the same to you, Yankees half backward, your rolled smoke sideways and limp in the pocket of your broad faced smile. Now you're dying, on tubes and drips and flat beeps in an inclined bed. So when I arrive at your room and sling my handbag and jacket across the chair, kicking off my heels, I remember that I never exactly told you how Montana made me an agoraphobic wreck. That summer we lay flat on our backs, awestruck at this window to infinity, the night sky over Big Sky County. It was only a moment, but I realized two truths. Firstly, that God is very real. And secondly, that I was a minute speck of atom dust, infinitely smaller than I had ever comprehended, just hitching a ride through an endless universe. That night, I sweated, wide-eyed over these truths, lying listening in my white ribbed vest and cotton night shorts zip-locked into our two-man tent. Sometime post midnight, those thoughts triggered a full blown panic attack. Heart pounding, I skittered out into cricket song, smouldered ash fires and late night conversational hums, begging my heart to slow, gulping cold mountain air in great heaves, the paused conversations in the lamplight wondering what was wrong. What the hell was I doing there? A continent away from home in that expanse of land, a land that showed me the universe with the exact same nonchalant flourish it had used to show me waterfalls and transparent lakes, or the fat bison that had wandered bored across our trail, the two brown bears leafing berries in the distance as we clutched bear whistles and spray. I had only ever known small green cornered counties or curved coastal edged townlands where the sky and the land knit together. In Montana, 
I longed to gather the corners of the world down to me, pull their edges tighter so I could pin the sky to the earth in a kiss, bend the breeze-tossed evergreens together in a blanket above my head to close me in. Do you remember skies? Do you ever replay them over again in your mind's eye? I remember glacier sky. It was the dome of the ceiling of the world. It embraced both the inky night and the sun-scorched continent in an ocean of stars and space. And I had swam in it, breathless, hands pressed flat to the earth, dirt beneath my nails, laughing and terrified, which were both the same to you. I stretch myself up onto the white hospital linens to lie flat against your chest. I am much smaller than your six foot frame. There's a mechanical rise, hiss and fall as the machine forces your lungs wide, but I twist to lie flat against you all the same, face down, belly touching your broken chest. I won't fall off. My empty arms stretch wide as I balance in the hope you will never meet. Look, no hands, I whisper. I want to tell you about the Turner sunset. I want your mind to forever explode in sunsets with me. As Nitty, as Nitty said, all the submissions for the storms are red blind. Um, we, have a, we had a traffic light system. So, you know, we would, we would read through everything and I would say, you know, this one's green or this one's amber or this one's red. And then we'd meet, we met up and, and sort of went through and see what we shared, what, what was green and then what was amber and, and went through it. But um, the extraordinary thing is, one, because we don't know who, as you said, we don't know who anybody is. So it kind of makes it easier to read through. There's no preconceived ideas, notions. Um, but what is great is when you have to battle you, know, you have to battle for that one that you had as, as green and you wanted it to be green and, and you know, we'd sit and read and mostly it was nitty reading and I'd go, yeah, 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 you know, you read it and it made sense. But that's the thing, the, the ability that, to share this experience with somebody so that we could play off each other and, and say, well, this is what I felt, what did you feel? Or this is what stirred me or what about this word? And I'd say, I don't know what that word means. And she'd say, yes, but it's beautiful. And you'd go, yeah, okay. Um, all right, next up, it is time for the current poet in residence at Poetry Ireland. Um, she is the author of three collections of poetry and the latest of which is 28 Letters of a New Alphabet and she's currently working on her fourth collection and that is with the support of a literature bursary from the Arts Council and also from Dublin County Council. And along with all that, she also found time to host Who Let the Books Out along with Fiona Bulger, a spoken word event that celebrated all of the collections that came out during COVID but didn't get to have an actual launch. And because I got to be a part of that, I will be forever grateful. I, it is with an enormous thrill that I get to welcome to the storms Anne Tannen. <laughs> to everybody. Um, it's just lovely to see many familiar faces. Um, I'm just going to read the poem that's in the, in the launch. Uh, sorry, I had COVID during the week and I still have COVID brain. I'd like to apologise. Um, the, the poem that's in this beautiful, beautiful book and then one more poem um, from the next collection which will be coming out in 2024. Um, <clears throat> the poem of the collection, uh, and it really is, so, is it just so beautiful, you know, the feel of it and the care and love that's gone into it. So thank you so much to Damien and thank you so much to Nithi. Um, the poem uh, is called Foster and uh, I, I was listening to a, a podcast about attachment and it spoke about these really inhumane experiments with animals to see what would happen if they didn't, were, if they were taken away from their mother very young. Um, so this is called Foster. Take a goose named Felicity. Take an experiment. Take Felicity isolated in a room after she hatches. Take a machine that feeds her. Take a thermostat that clicks. Take Felicity running toward it. Take her disappointment. Take her head moving rapidly from side to side.
Take days passing. Take Felicity introduced to other geese. Take the term misfit. Take a gander approaching Felicity. Take her fear. Take Felicity's head moving rapidly from side to side. Take her nesting behavior. Take eggs placed under her. Take her indifference. Take more eggs. Take Felicity sitting on them. Take goslings hatching. Take her indifference. Take bare limp bodies. Take hardy duck eggs. Take their hatching. Take five ducklings running toward the water. Take Felicity's indifference. Take Felicity in the yard. Take the ducklings on the pond. Take a storm. Take the ducklings seeking shelter. Take Felicity opening out one wing. Take the ducklings disappearing into warm softness. Take six steady heartbeats. Take Felicity's head nodding up and down. Take the clouds passing. Next up, we have the recipient of an Arts Council Agility Award in 2023 and a poet and a prose writer who was long-listed long in the National Poetry Competition. She has had work appearing in places like Skylight 47, The Moth, Poetry Wales, The York Literary Review, The Fifth Wheel, and now I'm delighted to say The Storms Journal. Please give it up for Christina Henneman. page 40 if you want to read along and I have to say the pairing with the artwork is just wonderful um, it's just perfect so this uh, poem is inspired by the northern lights that I could see in February from Sligo Bay where I live and I felt very blessed to see this this was the first time I ever saw the northern lights so I felt very lucky this is called The Visitor odd in this curtain of light we fill our eyes like cups with stars as if the shattering of dawn would soon illuminate the sea, sink into our mercury grains. The moon, spoon lamp, glistens on waves whispering over pebbles. We are frail and bare here, wrapped in the solar wind, wonder cutting us from dreams that turn out to be chimerical. You sway as a flicker of green against my night sky open arms, leaf of grass from wombing earth. In the reaching of the red flare towards the firmament, I throw my hat back and I, and I breathe. Another morning has just been born, slick with vernix and traces of blood. As Christina said there, of course, uh, very important for us to do a shout out to all the artists because this is a journal of poetry, prose and visual arts. Uh, the painting that accompanies Christina's poem is by Charity McArdle. Um, the, the journal is still beginning, you know, it's still young, so people are beginning to trust us. You know, we get a lot of poetry, probably because it started as a poetry podcast, and now short stories thankfully take part. And slowly we have um, artwork creeping in. This issue, we had jo um, Joshua Vermillion. He is an artist who's based in Las Vegas, and he was our featured artist, so he opens each section of the journal. And of course, we had, you know, the first editor, Gaynor Kane, um, is one of our artists. We have Catherine Brennan, Alan Murphy. You'll see, grab yourself a copy. The journal is actually on sale at the back of the church as you're leaving, just in case if you don't have one. Um, it's also available at the Winding Star Bookcase. It's going to be available in Charlie Burns in Galway very shortly. Um, and it's also in No Alibis in Belfast. So thanks to those for stocking it. And of course, it's available at ethestorms.com. Let's get a move on. Okay, so next up, we have a guest who has travelled down from County Antrim to be with us today and is a regular spoken word performer. Her poetry has appeared in places like the Bangor Literary Review, Live Encounters, Belfast Arts, 
Belfast Community Arts Partnership Anthologies 2022 and 2023, and she's most recently appeared in the Morecambe Poetry Festival Anthology 2023. She is studying for an MA in Creative Writing at Open University, and her debut pamphlet is on the way next year. Reading for us her extraordinary poem, Saved by a Starman, and more, this is Mary E. Ringland. Well, it's just absolutely wonderful to be here today, so thank you, Damien. Thank you, Nessie, as well. Uh, look, I'll read uh, my contribution to the journal first. It's page 44, if anybody wants to read along with me. It's a, I, sh I should probably explain a bit of the background. Uh, I did a workshop not so long ago, and it was to base a poem on childhood memory uh, to do with Northern Ireland, you know, and uh, normally it's a subject I would avoid, like the plague, because there aren't a lot of good memories if you were a child my age, you know, back then. Uh, but this one just popped up out of nowhere, and it's actually... Uh, reference to uh, Bloody Friday. Uh, for some reason, it, yeah, it's something I'd never ever thought about until just, you know, a short while ago. It's entitled Saved by a Starman. It plays in my head like pitted newsery of a ball and minute blitz on a bloody Friday afternoon, Belfast 1972. It plays in my head like a vile voice over fractured ear-piercing whispers, penetrating dust motes, heavy with the scent of twisted metal. It plays in my head like an eerie echo of a deconstructed day, awash with shattered lives and scattered spectacles. It plays in my head like a macabre melody from a star man waiting in the sky astride the mangled framework of York Road Station, his hand stretched through the gap in reason, ready to pluck me from the chaos. About two weeks ago, I headed down to County Limerick for the first time in about 20 years for the launch of my next guest and her debut poetry collection. It's called Real Words and it was published by Revival Press and I urge you all to go out and grab yourselves a copy. We first met thanks to Catherine Ann Cullen, the former poet in residence at Poetry Ireland, and thanks to her uh, Twitter prompts during COVID, which brought a huge poetry community together. And it was through that that I got to learn of this next guest talent, and it has been a joy to see her work being recognised. She was the winner of the Troker Poetry Competition, the winner of the Bangor Ephrastic Poetry Challenge, and her work has appeared in places like the Galway Review, the Ogham Stone Live Encounters, and the Stony Thursday Book. From Castle Connell in County Limerick to St. Audience Church here in Dublin, I'm delighted to hand you over to Mary Sturder. Thank you very much, Damien, and thank you, Nitty. My poem in the book, in the journal, is called Grotto, and I don't think it needs any introduction. Grotto. She flicks hand, forehead to breast, makes a sign of her cross before a shelter of penitent rocks. She exchanges deadhead intercessions for cellophane chrysanthemums sits on a white bench carved with initials and blotches of almost bleached obscenities. A blue plastic bag quivers on the cracked concrete beside her trembling foot. Next up, we have the author of the poetry collection In a Changing Light, which was published by Salmon Poetry. His work has appeared in various literary journals and anthologies, and he's been featured on a number of national and international local radio art shows, and he's also a regular at spoken word and poetry events, festivals here in Ireland and abroad. I'm very pleased to say joining us today to read his poem, The In-Betweenness and More, is Phil Lynch. 
Hi everyone. Thanks very much to Damien and Neeti for selecting my work. Uh, it's a thrill to be in this fabulous collection. Congrats to everyone else who's in there as well. Um, I'm just going to read the piece that's here. It's uh, on page 66. Um, just a few words about the background. It began life a few years ago as a contribution to a collaborative project I was involved with. The idea being that a couple of people would come together, two or three, from different artistic disciplines or genres to create new work between them. So meaning they had to step outside their, their, their usual artistic uh, comfort zone. And it was organized by, it's a group in Dunleary Ratdown, a voluntary artistic uh, collective called uh, Artnet DLR, covers all the genres. So I uh, collaborated with a, a, a multimedia artist, Hilary Williams, on this particular project. And all the projects when were completed went into an exhibition. So, but we, the, the theme was hinterland. And it was very open. It could be the hinterland of Dunleary Ratdown or the hinterland of the head or anything in between. Um, so uh, we uh, took that fairly liberally, although did, we did concentrate a lot on the hinterland of Dunleary Ratdown as well and broadened it out. Uh, we started with a focus on the Monkstown Marsh uh, area and uh, we created eventually what was probably called a, a poetry film, uh, which then went on a loop with this exhibition for a few weeks. Um, and you have to imagine the images today because uh, we don't have, it, have the film. Um, this is an abridged uh, version, a revised and edited version of, of that. So um, there were no Joshua trees there, of course, and like the, the lovely image before it uh, from Damien. Um, so it's page 66, and it's called In Betweenness. Coal stones by the beach capture a glint of evening light momentary blossoms on a monotone sandscape. After we ran aground, we found new headlands. Dilapidated paths led us through a blur of briery firs to open marshes, fertile wetlands, refuge for wildlife. Tree trunks skulk by the marsh's edge, bare broken branches crane to watch us pass. Protruding roots wrapped serpent-like around each other threaten our progress. A man at the edge relieves himself, adding to the detritus. Further in, the shapes of mountains stained by winter's harshest frost and sun-dried rains of summer slope down to meet the woods above the new roads straddling the outer scatter. In between, the hubbub of the hinterland, sinews stretched with every breath, remnants of salt marsh sanctuary for species of wildlife to rest and refuel among flowers, shrubs, weathered plants. Circles of green in brackish water, graceful flight of the heron, its harsh call of arrival, a siren for the hard lives of those who come here to sleep and leave behind relics of their presence to taunt our consciences. Flutter of its swift wings before the splish as water is sliced with precision. Squawks and sweeter chirps from hedges and tangled growth over which hawks stalk their prey. Screech of wheels on steel of rail line dividing marsh from sea. Small boats bob, stiff breeze drives clouds to blow shimmering showers in over the brown shore across the space inside where news once went back and forth in written words, images unseen, linking people and places. Flying ships now crisscross above this place that harbours history from before the city spread its cloak to wrap around a hinterland of plenty, rising to the hills, sheltered by the mountains, slanting to the sea, sinking in the swamp of progress ever-changing, evolving within its own skin, open to the world, orbiting on its axis, while generations spin past, each believing they have seen the best of it. We find our hinterland in the space between the image and the reality of place, our past and future bound by nature as the railway binds city to suburb and beyond. Like migrant species and sanctuary seekers, we too must move on. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. What's incredible is, even though you set a theme, is the diversity, the routes, the roads that people pick um, in terms of their submissions. Uh, the first issue of the storms, the theme was Eat the Storms. Uh, not very original, but you know, it felt like we needed to start somewhere. Um, and Gaynor Kane was the sub editor at that point, and at one point Gaynor said, I can't read another poem about rain. Um, and the poems were not about rain, but it was, you know, it was just a funny comment that came in. You know, it seemed to be a lot of weather poems, but it wasn't really about the weather. So for the second issue, I decided not to have a theme at all. And over 2,000 poems came in, and short stories and prose and, um, and artworks. And I almost lost my eyesight. And Eileen, when I sent her this short, really long list, thought, oh my god, I don't know if I have enough time. Um, but so we decided again for this one to go with a theme and shelter, sanctuary and sanctum. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, it really is extraordinary to, to read through. And even those who are not selected, you know, there's a, a limited amount of pages in the journal. There's a limited amount of, of money I can actually spend. I would like to spend much more and have almost everyone in. Um, but I suppose that's what the selection process is all about. Now, enough about me. We are off now to County Kerry to an islander who is currently working on a novel and writes flash fiction and short stories. She is also a part-time MA student in creative writing at the University of Limerick and we are very pleased to share the storm spotlight today with the author of The Boathouse because it almost didn't make it because of a few emails that went awry and you know I had to do some searching and some Twitter DMs to finally make sure that she still wanted to take part and thankfully she did. So I'm delighted to hand you over to June O'Sullivan. Damien and Nathie, I was very happy just to sit there and listen to everybody else reading. Um, and thank you as well to Damien for the super sleuthing. Um, I just presumed I hadn't been selected. I had seen other people sharing it on social media and then I was delighted to get his message to say, are you the June I'm looking for? And I was very glad to say yes. <laughs> uh, so my story is on page 72. Uh, it's titled The Boathouse. And it came about as a piece of homework from a writing group that I'm a, a, a member of. And I was the only one to do the homework, so I feel <laughs> I've been justly rewarded for my efforts. The Boathouse. I put my watch to my ear to check if it is still working, even though it's not the kind of watch that ticks. Do watches tick anymore? Mine is a Patek Philippe Nautilus. It can do lots of things. It self-winds, for one. That's useful. I don't have time in my life for winding a watch. My wife bought me this watch for my 50th birthday. Ex-wife. Still getting used to that one. I wanted a weekend in Amsterdam. I wanted to get off my face and into another dimension. When I told her that, she smiled and a few days later gave me this watch. I keep it for special occasions. I would feel guilty if I didn't wear this expensive lump of metal that someone who no longer loved me bought me for my birthday two weeks before she asked for a divorce. The point is, it doesn't tick. I'm pretty sure it is working. I've just lost track of time. That happens when you're in a dark place. I am in a dark place, figuratively and literally. The old boathouse windows are boarded up. Too many trigger-happy young lads around here who like taking shots at old buildings after a few beers. I'm showing my age again. They probably don't even drink beer. No doubt they snort something or smoke something. If I had a teenage son, I would know, but I don't. I shoot blanks, medically speaking, so the line stops with me. The hardware still does what I want it to do. The fact that the programming is faulty stopped bothering me a long time ago. I am a 50-year-old man, free to go where I like, and I am locked inside an old boathouse at the end of my parents' garden. There are worse places to be. The light is filtering through the slatted boards on the window. I watch dust motes dance gaily in the beam and feel the last of the whiskey I guzzled at lunch buzz through my veins. I'm starting to sober up. This I do not want. I was quite happy to be intoxicated. I put my all into it, ignoring the looks from my mother and Sandra. I kick at the ground, raising more dust around me where I sit, back to the wall. My back is to the wall. 
I shut my eyes and lean my head back. I slide my head left and right across the stucco. It feels like a massage. When last did a human hand touch me, touch my head? My eyes fill with tears. I squeeze my lids tight. I will not cry. I could pay someone to touch me, not in a seedy way, a masseuse, a proper one, in a legitimate spa. I open my eyes again and look to the ceiling. There is a nest up there. I have no clue what kind of nest it is. I know nothing about birds. I am not very well up on ornithology. My father is, was. He loved sitting in the garden, watching the birds flitting around the feeder. He would write their names, the time of their visit, and how many there were in a small spiral-topped notebook, keeping track. For what? I slip my hand into my pocket and take out the notebook. I flick through it. The neat measured handwriting flickers past like animation. I hold it to my nose to seek some trace of him, but it just smells of paper. I never knew about the birds. Sandra told me. She put in the hours here with him, and she put in the hours trying to convince me to talk to him, to mend fences before it was too late. I get to my feet, slowly, easing out the stiffness in my knees. I brush at the dust coating my pants and brace myself to go back in, finish the job, shake the hands, thank the priest, talk to mom about the headstone. Then I might take that bottle of whiskey home and finish it off too. I turn the key, open the door and step out into the evening light. So now we seem to be travelling all around the country and now we have a poet who is juggling life between Dublin and Mayo, holding an MA in Translation Studies and a PhD in Internet Research. Her work has appeared in places like Drawn to the Light and Covid Queen. I'm delighted to welcome to the story sharing her poem Driving Directions for Soul Cleansing and More, Cathy Family. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here today in this beautiful place. Thank you to Damien and Nitti for their incredible work on this beautiful, beautiful issue. And thank you for giving my poem a home in a storm. <laughs> so I'm going to give you driving directions in Mayo. <laughs> driving directions for soul cleansing. Start from Westport. No one would ever start from anywhere else. Follow the signs if you can. Drive slow on the twisting road until you see Pro Patrick. Gaze upon it. Smile at the scattering of snow <coughs> in the small church at the top and leave it behind. Suddenly on your right, all the blues in the world have gathered in Clue Bay, flirting with depth, playing with greys and greens. They will plunge into your eyes and flow steady and calm through your body and your mind. Let them guide you to Lewisburg, to the small road on the right that leads to Carrowmore. Already, the world is silent behind you. Right ahead, Clare Island stands guard over you. Let the sun smile under your feet. Let the wind brush salt water on your face. A ray of sun warm your skin <coughs> and dry it. Hear the swish of ancient stones hush you and soothe you. Breathe. There were so many poems, there were so many um, paintings, there were so many short stories like that that were so difficult to say no to. But again, you know, there is a limit, but um, I do feel very, very blessed by the ones that we got to be surrounded by. And thank you so much again to everyone who has contributed or who has submitted. Um, all right, next up, we have not only a storyteller, but also a poet, a playwright, and a singer-songwriter who is the recipient of four Arts Council Awards for Literature and the beneficiary of two prestigious literary scholarships, the W.B. Yeats International Summer School in 2018 and the John Hewitt International Summer School in 2019. Maybe that's the John Hewitt calling with another anniversary. Um, this resulted in the staging of her um, play set to poetic verse. Today, coming to us with their story, Monday Morning Mist, this is Rosemary Timulty. If that 
as a literary agent, tell them yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Monday morning mist. Um, reflections on miscarriage and stillbirth. With the sea breeze whipping at my face, I turn my back on the wind, on life. My hair sticks to salt-streaked cheeks, binding as fingers on my exposed neck. I gasp for breath. A solitary seagull soars overhead, wings extended, catching the updraft, its body then plummeting, streamlined through bruised, angry clouds. Its soulful screech and plaintive cries of loss, pain and emptiness engulf me. Or is this my core calling out to the ether? Are these sounds being emitted from my throat, my fractured heart? I hardly know anymore. A scream howls on the wind. I can hear the child I lost calling to me, haunting my days, disturbing my nights. My child, my flesh and blood, gone from within my body. Ripped by premature labour from its womb embrace. The attempt at consoling words from family and friends, simply salt rubbed into a weeping wound. I don't want their words, their pity. I want to gaze into the soft, unfocused eyes of my newborn baby. Rub my nose on the soft down of her little head, cradled in the safe embrace of my hands. Smell that milk-laden baby scent. Rejoice at the cooing and sucking sounds at my breast. My inner being screams with anger at an unjust life. Months later, my mind and body have no recognition of the cobbled roads or concrete slabbed pavements of before. I am a stranger to the streets and paths I once knew. Now there is only after. Muscle memory pulls me to the grassy slopes, the fast-running streams, the forested hillsides and soaring mountains of my youth, foothills of home. Summits beckon in primeval fashion, luring onwards, always upwards. Like Icarus, the sky awaits my fall. I find myself in the stillness of an early Monday morning at the foot of the mountain, mist hovering over valley and glen, the world behind me lies sleeping. My physical efforts, a savage assault to clear mind and soul, spur me on. Sleeve gullion beckons. Seeking succour, I make my way beneath the leafy canopy of ancient oak and ash. I can almost hear the caliph bearer whispering my name, summoning me to be old before my time. Her hag-like scepticism mocking me ridiculing my every step. The push and pull, urging me forwards, then goading me into retreat, lambasting my efforts, a body weak and weary beneath her assault, the desire to surrender overwhelming, a mind begging for sanctuary. But with one foot simply following the other, I stay on my chosen path to conquer the summit. My feet move onward of their own accord, scrambling up the shaded glen, solitary bird and accompaniment. A stream gurgles at my feet. Pausing, I glance up. Light dances and catches, playing on the underside of the leafy, oak-festooned canopy, dispersing the chill. Warmth creeps into my weary bones. Breaking free of cover, at last I reach the summit. Scooping handfuls of cool water from the lake, I douse my face, my neck, arms and a sheen of perspiration mingles with the pale liquid gold. From the trig point of Slivgallion, I stand in awe at what nature presents before me. The entire ring-dike formation plays out about me, my body at its central hub. With the early morning mist rising and clearing in pockets, I am humbled by the gradual reveal, both within my heart and that which lies before me. The richness of culture, heritage and beauty rolling drumlins guiding the eye to far-off landscapes of soil and sea of home. I stand in awe. The solitude brings me peace. Today this mountain is mine. Montague's words spring to mind and in the moment are apt. 
like dolmens round my childhood, the old people. Today, as I recall the words of my family and friends, they lend me comfort, embracing my bruised and weary heart. Looking far down into the valley below, Monday morning mist, her name redolent of mystery, tradition and purity, grace, yes, this is who bathes me. Now, with my back pressed to the primeval granite stones of Gr Gullion's passage tomb, I face due west and wonder at the souls who came here some 6,000 years ago, stones aligned to embrace the winter solstice sunset, rays welcomed to its core. I throw my head back, eyes closed, my face bathed in sunlight. With hands splayed on the rocks behind me, the wind plays through my hair. This sanctum of place and time nurture my soul. This moment gives me pause. Flagellated by demons of time, of circumstance, their weight momentarily bears down upon me. My hand flutters to the gnawing emptiness at my core. The calabara susurration of sorrow feeds on my grief. Her gnarled teeth prey on my body and on my mind. My knees buckle like Christ on the steps. The cross digs deep. Tears course down my cheeks and yet I tear myself from the ground to stand once again trembling in the face of revelation like souls from thousands of years before i am here i am whole mind and body clear i breathe a fresh breeze dances once again through my hair to be cleansed healed by place is a rare and beautiful gift now that i've become reacquainted with nature re-engaged with life I can feel my inner core being re recharged once again. I feel replenished. I have faith that Zephyr winds will carry me to their bosom. This is my time, my place, my life. I shall not fall. Thank you. We are now heading to Cork for a poet and a storyteller who is a resident artist in Semple Studios. She completed her residency with the Play It Forward Fellowship in 2022 and has read as part of the Dublin Literature Festival, the Cork International Poetry Festival, the Migrant Authors of Ireland and also the Breaking Ground Writers at the Kirch International Festival. I'm delighted to welcome to the Storms, Neo Florence and Good afternoon, I'm so excited to be part of the Poetic Storm. And I just arrived a while ago from Cork, so Dublin's weather is, is nice today. <laughs> um, I'm going to, to read a poem, my poem from page 100, uh, Mess of Moors Madonna. I write my body as an immortal bird, seen before sunset. Bl bending, blending, intertwining with the waves of the wind. I write my body as billowy clouds, memories dripping with blood, falling into a hollow pot. I see my body as a house of mirrors, filled with nature's treasures, javelins, orchards, pebbles, seashells, rosebuds, and feathers. I see my body as wrinkled skin, kneading clay back to fertile birth, wobbling, spurning on the potter's wheel, turning round and round. Our next guest holds a BA in Arts and Humanities and has completed her, her portfolio of poetry for her dissertation and she works in the summer as a boat skipper in Kilkenny. Her work has been published in places like Apricot Press, The Honest Ulsterman, Drawn to the Light and The Martello. Today, sharing poems with us, including Fixing Up Ruski, from this issue, I'm delighted to hand you over to Anne-Marie Dunn. And then on flip side, of that is the good of being able to fix up Ruski, um, uh, my much-loved grandmother's home where I spent all my summers and it's, it's actually a townland outside Balhadreen in County Roscommon. Um, okay, so fixing up Ruski. 
I bring the best of the house that was sold, the china cabinet with the Art Deco decanter, the 1960s kitchen table made of Formica, the ironing board that is older than me, her New York dresser still pristine and polished. The parlour is dry lined, plastered and painted, the gutters cleaned, moss scraped off the roof, French doors for the kitchen to let in the garden, fresh white paint both inside and out, a yellow front door to finish it off. Ruski, its wildness a refuge, our escape from suburban drab Dublin. Now it's in a new round of renewal, now it's my turn to sit in the garden as ancestors sing in the shush of the ash. Our penultimate guest has work in places like Bridge, the New Ulster, Green Ink Poetry, Skylight 47, and has been a very welcomed guest on the Eat the Storms podcast. I had the joy to see her and to hear her read at the 20th anniversary of Over the Edge in Galway, which commemorated the late, great Kevin Higgins. And I am honoured that Kevin was one of the contributors to the Storms inaugural issue. This guest is currently working on her debut collection, reading her poem Nidra and more. I'm delighted to hand you over to Terry Metcalf. Thank you, Damien, and um, thank you, Nitty, as well, for um, choosing my poem. It's a great honour. Um, the poem that, that uh, was published in the journal, which is Nidra, which is a Sanskrit word meaning to draw forth a state of nothingness. I had forgotten how the dark can comfort, not the black dead night, nor the birth of morning, not that time in the autumn dusk when nature presents its sanctuary and birds sing their truth, not stepping into the air of a twilight world where moss grows damp with blessings, not where the sun becomes an ordinary star throwing its spotlight on the moon who laughs like a freed woman. But the dark where the engine mind closes, where eyes pressed blank with metal cease their quivering, where it could be said a mirror stays dry, but for one cool throttle. Okay, it is time for our last act. I think uh, it's a fair fair way to describe uh, how we're ending today. Um, I'm about to introduce you to our featured prose writer. Um, she is the author of Rejuvenation, a speculative fiction trilogy. She is also the co-founder of the incredible flash fiction Armal, which I got to see earlier this year as part of the John Hewitt International Festival. She is also the co-author of the play Impact, Armagh's train disaster, which is about to be staged at the Armagh Theatre. She is an Arts Council Northern Ireland supporter, and she actually had another story that she wrote for the Storms Journal when I asked her to be our featured uh, prose writer this year. But when the festival finished, when the international, when the John Hewitt Festival finished, we were sitting in her living room the next day having a beautiful lunch and suddenly a table reading of her climate change play unfolded. And as it did, I thought, this is what we need. This is what we need in the journal. And so I wasn't the only person to say this is what we need, as it has been picked up in various places. And I hope you'll get to see the full version of it soon. It's not a prose piece, it's actually a play, and it's called Toxic Relationships. What you're going to see right now is the opening scenes. I let me introduce you to Geoffrey and Edwina, two ungainly and ridiculous. T. Rexes. The author of this is Biddy Lee, and she is accompanied by another Arma living legend, Malachi Kelly. Here we go. Uh, uh, Did you ask me about it? 
been there since the 12th century. I imagine it's the first time that two T-Rexes have wandered up its aisle. Uh, we have reached the end. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming along today for the launch of Issue 3. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to every contributor, to all of you, the listeners, to my family, my mum, my aunts, my cousins, my godson, Emma, who's outside selling as best as she can. Um, a huge thank you to Knitting. It has been a joy to work with you. Thank you so much. Thank you also to Eileen, who is my uh, self-editor, Eileen Dubuir, on issue two. And of course, thank you to Gaynor Kane, who couldn't make it today, but she's always with us in part. Um, and thank you to you, the Extraordinary Storms community that has built up over the past three years. I'm going to leave you with the opening poem, and it's by Julian Day, and it's called Prayers in Starlight. Beyond hungry ghosts who pray for better days. Beyond smoking cities riddled with shock and awe. Beyond all obvious hope. Beyond all we know and don't know yet. May we all be sheltered as long as summer days hold heat. Rest under this canopy cooling of green leaf shadow, away from all the stinging on hinged things. Your meal bag at August